My name is Sarah James and welcome to the Digital Craft Festival. I'm here today with Angie Parker and Dr. Kate Strasden. I'm actually handing over the, the interview today to Kate Strasden. She'll tell you a little bit about herself and she's, uh, she's leading today's, um, today's Master Maker Q&A. So welcome Kate and welcome Angie. Thank you. Um, it's really lovely to be doing this because I have had, I've really enjoyed the last couple of days doing the uh, meeting various makers and it's been, it's been fantastic. So yeah, my name's Kate Strasden. I'm a senior lecturer in, uh, in cultural studies and I work in the Fashion and Textile Institute at Falmouth University. So, um, so for me, being able to have a chat with Angie about her work and practice through textiles is really exciting and um, I'm really looking forward to having our chat today. So welcome Angie and welcome everybody else. Thanks Kate. Cheers. Yes, hello everyone. Um, hello. So uh, I just wondered first of all Angie, what when, when, when I was looking at pictures of you at your loom and I was thinking that's such a the, the, the piece of equipment that the loom is, when was the moment for you that you kind of first sat down at the loom and thought, oh, this is this is it, I found I found my thing. Well, it's interesting. It wasn't until I was at Cumbria College of Art in the early 90s. So I'd gone all the way through school and art foundation without doing any weaving apart from paper weaving and you know, very simple frame weaving. Um, so it was, that was my first experience and it was on a table loom and um, in, the, in the weave studio. Um, and on the, I remember clear as anything, it was a Tuesday morning and my first pick, the first time I passed the shuttle because the looms were set up for us um, and beat the weft down towards me. I just had the most contented feeling of, and a lovely little fizz and it's like, oh, I like this. And I think, I know we've got a couple of other weavers. I don't know whether they'd agree that it's a bit Marmite weaving. You, I think there is a real love or hate. Um, I obviously love it. But um, yeah, no, I'd always been uh, very comfortable with textiles, but never known exactly where. Um, but yes, it was, so I started off on a table loom and then of course moved on to the floor looms at college where I specialized in rug weaving. So that's where you started. So was it Cum Cumbria School of Art is where you actually, um, did you do foundation or was, how did that start for you? Yeah, I, did, I was at um, a, quite an academic grammar school um, with a brilliant art department. So I did A-levels. Um, I was actually the, I'm the youngest of four and I was the first in our family to, to go on to any further education. Um, and then I did art foundation and went off to interviews. But of course, coming out from this very academic, very strict all girls school to art foundation. I was a bit, I was a bit lazy, if the truth be known. So um, I didn't actually have a massive choice of colleges at my, uh, at my disposal, um, but it, it really fitted with Cumbria College of Art and Design. And I did intend to do embroidery um, and Angie Wyman, I don't know if anyone here knows her, she's now- um, She's at RSN, isn't she? Royal School of Needlework. Yeah, and she yeah. interviewed me, and I was as nervous as anything, this little 18 year old, 19 year old, whatever. And, uh, and she said, oh, uh, she, looking through my portfolio, she said, oh, I can see you've been comfortable with constructed textiles. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, in an interview, oh, yeah, okay. And so I was put into weave, and then I, I went along, I said, oh, I wanted to do embroidery, can I swap? And they said, well, try the weave, you might like it. And yeah, it was a bit of serendipity. Um, I was definitely put in the right place. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, I think that foundation year is really important, isn't it? Because what's interesting, fewer and fewer students are doing foundation now. Uh, they come straight from A-levels and, um, and, and it's always really noticeable, the students that do foundation, I think, that they, they really benefit from that. Yeah, it, it, it really gives you some focus and it rules out a lot of things. You know, we've got so many choices in life. Um, and it, it was, it's always, even now, to go and learn another discipline I was involved in um, an exhibition with Devon Guild a few years ago where I uh, worked with three other artists. One was a glassmaker, Stuart Lowe, and Ruth Broadway, a printmaker. And we, as part of this exhibition, we all tried each other's disciplines. And it was, it just stretches you in one direction and then you boing back to your comfortable place, but a little bit different. And an art foundation is great. I mean, yeah. And maybe it's a luxury that isn't really affordable these days and maybe we need to be looking at 
at that, why it's not. So. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I think that's part of it. So tell us, so practice wise, how, how would you, how would you describe your practice now? Uh, I should be better at that. It's uh, it's a predominantly a rug weaving practice, um, but it's it's such a niche uh, way of trying to earn a living. So there's a lot going on in in mine. I've got quite a few different income streams. Part of that is because I thrive on doing different things. Um, you know, there's a lot going on, and part of it has has come on this learning curve I've been on with my business. Um, of, of making it work to sustain the practice and and as a result you know making sure that I've got that energy and passion for it that I had when I first started the business because the business is also a second career for me and um, it's interesting that as well as the creative side which I know we get to talk about at length you know most of my life is also the business side it's it's a good balance between the two and I'm as passionate about running a business as I am about my creative process and if anything, I take the creativity a, a bit more for granted. Uh, the business is the big learning curve, whereas once I'm at the loom, that just yeah. sort of happens. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because I don't know. I mean, I'm sure lots of makers would say, God, the, the business part perhaps fills them with horror and, um, and, and slightly freaks them out when it comes to that. Um, so, so how do you, because colour is a huge part of your style isn't it but really strong colors where does that come from so well i've always enjoyed working with color but i i can definitely cite the time that i spent living in india as the time it all really changed um and i'll i've said it a few times now but when i arrived in india the color got under my skin immediately literally because um we arrived to coincide with holy festival um anyone I'm sure you're all aware it's the one where the paint gets thrown around so we we flew into India uh, we arrived at five o'clock on a Friday morning kind of got over the the jet lag and everything my husband went into work that day and then the, we on that evening the neighbors said oh come out with us tomorrow we were in this apartment block come out and um, come and join us for holy and we we walked outside and we just got bombed with paint as foreigners we were such an easy target and, and they did want us to wear our old clothes but it was we were pounded for about two hours of, with this powder paint and there was music and everyone's drinking giant bottles of kingfisher and it was such a welcome and such a you know a really fab way to experience this massive new country and different culture um, but I, I, it was about four showers before I got the blue out from under my fingernails. <laughs> uh, and you, but you can see that those splashes of neon that you've got in your because it's I mean they're bright colours but it's pro it's properly kind of neon and um, um, I know lots of people will be aware of your work and and recognise that. But yeah, that's it's a it's such a big part of what you do, isn't it? Yeah. So I think India definitely reset my colour settings um, and you just get so used to it every time I walked out through the front door there was just layers of saris and sawa kameezes all clashing you know some really you know with just full-on explosion and then the sunlight it was so bright so the colour was even more heightened um, and so I had you know practically a year of that being my normal what was going in to my head mm -hmm. and then I came back to Bristol and um, I was saying this the other day, Bristol's, I think it's really vibrant, lively, colourful, eclectic city. And it was October when we got back and it was just a bit grey and dull. And, um, but luckily, where I live, uh, we have Upfest, which is an urban graffiti festival. And so there's this ever changing, um, you know, shop sh shutters are being resprayed every other weekend. So they're getting a constant hit then of really again really vibrant colors so it's just become normal to me yeah. i don't it doesn't phase me i I've, i'm not scared of using it um oh, and there's another point about that is that in between starting my practice sorry finishing college and starting my practice i kept weaving i knew that the business would come one day i was just waiting for the right opportunity um and so i was weaving purely for my own enjoyment so there was never any market to think about. So I just made things that I loved that felt right to me. Um, and then when the business started, once these, all these things started to come out again, I realized there were some other people who had the same taste as me, which was lucky. 
so I've not really had to calm it down too much. It's you know, it's um, there is a market for my slightly warped sense of what's nice colours. <laughs> well, yeah. So that so by doing that groundwork, you're, but before it had to be so you didn't have the pressure of it being a commercial uh, thing at that point. You were able to you were able to kind of cut your teeth on some of the things without without that pressure, which is must have been a really uh, really exciting thing to be able to do. Yeah, it was like being at college forever, you know, it was 20, well, how long was it? That was a good 20 years probably before it all came together. So without the crits, which I may have benefited from, but. Yeah, but it's quite nice to have been there and done that. So, <laughs> um, so what about, uh, because you do, you do predominantly rug makings, but then you've got more of the textile art installation, haven't you, where you create panels? Yeah, so the reason that is, there's, the, the business side, um, I have to, the rugs and, and other products, they're the business side and I do love making them, there's no denying that. But there's a little part of me, this creative germ that's not fully flourished, germ's not the right word, seed, seed's a better word, isn't it? That's not fully flourished. Um, there's a bit more towards fine art. Um, and luckily, not long after I set up the practice, I joined a textile collective called Seam, which Penny, who's also here, she's, um, she's one of the members. And that's just to, I can't keep the art side um, as a priority in the business at the moment. It just doesn't work in where my life is at right now. Um, but it's a part that I have to keep alive. And, and having my own business, I can do that. So I, I don't make a massive amount of the art panels. I've got one here for anybody who's not familiar with what we're talking about. So I basically, it's the same one you saw the other day, Kate. But I basically use the rug weaving techniques mm -hmm. and scale them down into using fine intricate yarns mm -hmm. to create um, framed panels. Yeah, but they're beautiful. And what's that technique? I was very, I was very uncertain about saying the scandal. I'm going to let you say it because I fear that I could get it horribly wrong. So well, I was saying it wrong for years because Susan Foster, who taught me to weave, said crow broad. And that's much more English and, you know, sounds better um, from us. But I was, I taught in Amsterdam the year before last. And a Norwegian student um, was not letting me leave until I was saying, Krukbrag, oh, and I did it wrong then. Krukbrag, Krukbrag. I have to say it a few times because it's not a part of our mouth that we're familiar no, with. No, no, no. And I'm, that's why I'm very glad that you said it. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, it's Krukbrag, which is a Scandinavian three shaft weaving technique, um, which basically non weavers, it means when you thread up the loom, when you tie up the loom, you have different warp threads going through different shafts actually uh, the pedals on different shafts and you have to press the three sequences of pedals or three pedals in sequence to lift them in a particular order and then you pass your shuttle three times to cover all the warp to get one solid row of color so if you had one color the family are just arriving back by the way if there's any noise um if you were using one shuttle with uh, sorry, three shuttles with one colour, you would, you would get plain weave, or it looks like plain weave. But if you have three shuttles in different colours, that's how I build the patterns. So, um, yeah, I've got some samples. And, the, and the re another reason why the art panels started is when I, when I was working in my old job, I was, I was travelling around the country um, with the loom in the back of the car. So I couldn't have a very big loom. So I scaled all the work down then as well. I think that's where the art panels started to come. But now I, hello, now I um, often just weave a mini rug yeah. in the cottons and, and the fine stuff, just to check I've got the proportions right. Sometimes yeah, 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 like yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a really lovely technique. And so that, and I guess that then works really well with the way you use colour. It kind of lends itself to that way of working. Yeah, yeah. So you don't, uh, you won't see any of the warp threads. It's not, um, rug weaving is quite different to other types of weaving. Mm. Um, so the warp's completely hidden, which a lot of weft face patterns, you can then build up at the loom and, and make it up as you go along and follow what your instincts are telling you. And yeah, yeah. Because actually I thought that was really interesting when we chatted the other day about how you you said you don't really work to a plan. It just kind of you know how it's going to happen and, and that's quite unusual in that kind of work. Yeah, probably a bit reckless. Um, but some of that's come about 
because of circumstances. Um, I started the business when my children were obviously five or six years younger than they are now. Um, and well, when I, when I first started the idea before, before actually saying I'm properly in business, I was literally weaving when they were having a daytime nap or after they'd gone to bed. So there, were, there was a kind of element of me just get on the loom and go. And that's, um, and again, when I had my old job, I didn't have tons of free time to weave. It was something that was a little, something that I wanted to do and would find the time to do, but there wasn't a lot of it. So I think the designing got thrown out. Yeah, there wasn't time to plan. It was just speed weaving, get on there and go. <laughs> yeah, but it's working. So I'm not going to, although I have just designed something properly because it's um, the next product I'm making. Um, well, I was going to ask you, because I know you're not, you're, you're, not going to say too much about that, are you? But you have got a project that you're working on for a, a, a post-COVID um, yeah. launch, or how's what's what's what you you say? Well, that's this is another thing that ties in with the business. So I, I realised early on that no matter how much how many rugs I made and how much marketing I did, making a living from purely selling and weaving rugs was not it's not a business model that stands up really. So I um had one of my designs hand woven using recycled plastic um, a year or two ago. And I'm delighted to say that they've all gone. So we're now on to the next phase. Um, so I can't, yeah, it's a shame. I've not signed off on this next thing. So I, I don't want to talk about okay. it. But if, you, if, if you're watching and you sign up to my newsletter, you will definitely be the first to hear. But, um, but it has, it's, it's funny how, it's something I had in mind for next year. But the whole COVID thing is, has brought it forward and it, it, it's made it feel more relevant. It's, um, oh yeah, it's hard to say without. Well, no, 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 don't you, you <laughs> I, I was gonna ask you about your, so the, how, how, did you, how did you come to make the plastic, using the plastic, but where do you source it and how did that actually happen in the first place? I was very lucky. I, um, it was the first time that I'd, gone into production with something so I had a very um a lovely gentleman agent who held my hand and got me through the process of that because it was dealing with a workshop in India and you know that's that's massive for a business of one person it's not massive for lots of other businesses but I'm literally I I do it all I'm still one person it hopefully will grow soon but I'm not ready for that yet so it's having the confidence to keep your business at the right size. Anyway, so yes, he held my hand. Um, it was actually came about because I was trying to pitch to John Lewis, who wanted a rug to have, oh, I didn't mean to say the name. Oh, too late. <laughs> I was pitching to a department store and- um, Just between us, it's a circle. Just between us and, uh, on YouTube, this one. Um, but yes, and, and it, it, it fell down, it didn't happen, but we'd already sampled. So I then took it on myself and got the workshop to produce the minimum amount, which for me was enormous. And, you know, basically sorted out a very, it was, there was lots of very savvy maneuvers on my part. I was quite pleased with myself. And yeah, we had um, this product um, that I could take to market and sell at a different price point. Mm. And, you know, it was very closely based on one of the designs that I'd had in an exhibition that one of, um, I think it's some Evers to the Craft Festival actually owns, which is lovely. Um, so it's a version of that. So it's just nice to have another way for people to get my designs at a, at a different price point. Yes. And I think that the, the sustainability angle is, I mean, apart from the fact that we're all thinking about that now, maybe now more than more than ever because of how things have slowed over the last three months and where, where we're thinking at in, with, the, with, the, with the COVID situation. But also over the last two years, how we think about plastics and, um, and products that are sustainable. So, so it's a hugely timely endeavor, isn't it, that? Yeah, for, for the first time in my life, I was on trend. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was just as everybody was starting to really address the whole plastic thing. So that was a, a bit of good fortune. Um, but what that is in my practice, I heard a brilliant quote from Paul Weller this morning talking about a constant state of motion and the plastic rugs have absolutely served their, 
purpose in my business. I'm so pleased I did it and it's gone, um, it's, I've learned so much, but it has gone well. It has, it's not gone as best as it could have done because I learned a lot, but it's, it's gone well. Um, but going back to the sustainability long term, what I want to do is make the quality products that people then keep forever. You know, the rugs are thick um, and they're like a carpet, you know, they last the lifetime of a, a quality carpet. They're made from Axminster wool. So I'm, I'm very much and always have been on board with that. Buy one thing and let it travel through life with you mm. and don't change it over every you know 18 months because you've seen another room that you, that you like you know have it you, can, you know obviously we need people to spend and buy things but but you know treasure this and and you know buy less buy better yeah 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 absolutely and I think uh that definitely comes through I mean I think it's I'm noticing it at, at, at my work the, that students are bringing a lot of that to their work now I think in Falmouth we've got that we've got that coastal we're down by the sea there's lots of people that go there for for uh all sorts of reasons that are connected to where it is but it definitely seems to be much more on people's minds and part of their consciousness now yeah absolutely and yeah so thankful that we're in an industry that um is able to adapt to that I mean it's what craft's always been it craft isn't doing anything uh, new there but it's almost like <laughs> the world's come back caught up again yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm reading Glenn Adamson's again um fewer better things I mean and it is it's the way it's like also going back to the 1950s so but yeah it's very fortunate to be in this industry right now yeah how do you find textiles then as because the thing that's always struck me working in an art school where you have got people making lots of different products that textiles uh, and well and dress for me but textiles still um it's it's a very it's a very female kind of uh traditionally based activity isn't it and do you still do you still find that it sits differently compared to other decorative arts or how do you find it um, I think in the craft world, it's, I'm just seeing who was watching because um, I know there's another rug weaver, so they might pop along, I don't know if they're here, but um, yeah, well I think, I think the Annie Albers at the Tate last year has certainly helped weaving um, mm. and textiles generally, I think, I think attitudes are changing a bit, especially with the fine art as well, the applied art. Um, but yeah, no, as a, in craft, I think we'd all be better off being ceramicists. <laughs> it's got, that seems to have held on to that status of being the high value collectible. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel there's is a time for change and it's happening. And yeah, yeah. like I say, mainly, mainly the Annie Albers at the table. Well, I know, I mean, just thinking about that, the, the, the Bauhaus was, the only reason she did weave was because she wasn't allowed to do anything else essentially wasn't she so um it's it's just i, I think that's really interesting and, and yet what a fantastic exhibition that was and celebration of weave uh, in in those forms yeah well and historically back to before the industrial revolution the women all made the master made mm -hmm. physically because of the physical restrictions of um and uh, there's the, if you look in the UK, there's not many rug weavers, uh, but the leading one in the UK, um, I think most people would agree, is Jason Collingwood. So you've got, you know, this craft uh, discipline that's uh, filled with women, <laughs> and yet the one who, who's, you know, um, again celebrated, although he absolutely deserves that. He's an incredible mm. weaver. Yeah. Um, but yeah. It's it's a rug weaving itself is a tricky tricky discipline to to make it work. I mm -hmm. about that. So how does your what does your working day look like? I mean, how does it work business wise for you? Because um, have you got family and where's your loom? How does how does that work? Yeah, <laughs> um, well, I was, I was laughing the other day. It's like working from home is now become living at work. But um, in in the before times, um, <laughs> do you remember my working day was um, very much still very family orientated. I set my business up because I didn't want to go back to my old job after having the children. I've got three kids, um, so I wanted a business that fitted around the children. 
So the business could have grown bigger by now or quicker, or, um, and it has grown well. I mean, I did quite raise my profile quite quickly, quite early on. Um, but I'm keeping it at a certain level now until the children are, are less, um, you know, not dependent, but I want to be around for them. So I, I'd usually take, they, my day, working day would be around the school day and was quite short lived. And then I usually dip in again in the evening. But now, oh my God, I've got to get some better boundaries. It's, um, it's quite ridiculous at the moment because I'm never completely at work or not never, but hardly ever completely at work and certainly never completely not at work either. And I'm sure any other makers with families would identify with this. But I am quite disciplined. I am quite efficient. Um, I have found it harder to, to be productive at the loom, but I had, there's so many ways of uh, helping you get through that. And I've just now putting up some really good podcasts, um, some really old Sarah James's conversations in the build up to the festival. Mm. Just, just to give your brain a break. Yeah. Very important. So the loom is in your house and... Sorry. No, the looms, I have got a studio. Oh, you yeah. have? Yeah, I did Hot House when I started the business. I was lucky to get onto that programme. Mm. And um, on the first session of that, I realised I needed to get the loom. I was working at home before then, mm. but I needed a studio. But the studio has snuck home for obvious reasons um, when we saw the way that, the, the, when we knew this was coming, I brought home loads of sampling looms and most of the, lots of yarn. And because I was going to be demonstrating at craft festival, I actually did float the idea of bringing the loom home and putting it in the kitchen. <laughs> and everyone, everyone yeah. was, the family said, yes, they're so lovely. And then I had a little reality check. It's like, don't, don't do that, Andrea. <laughs> I like that it was it was there as a as a possibility just briefly. <laughs> I know they're so I couldn't ask for a better family. I mean the children. I say I've ordered a business that fitted around the children, and I think the reality is I've got children that fit around my business. Bless them. So, do you think is there a way in which the that lockdown and the, and COVID has has in a way. Has it had an impact on your work, do you think? Or because you said you brought sampling looms home. And so just has there been have there has there been any sort of experimentation going on or um no, not really. I did I did do some uh, rose path early on, which is the next step up from Krugbragd. And it had been on my mind to try it to sample again because I've not done it for a long time. So I did treat myself to that in the early days. But to be fair, um, I've been re I, I, in the scheme of all this um, and not glossing over the horrendous situation the world and this country, particularly this country is in, um, I've been very fortunate. We, we count ourselves as the lucky ones um, in, in that we've, my husband's working and my business, uh, yeah, is kept going. Mm. So I've not steered too far away from where I was apart from I've shifted everything around, so the the <laughs> dog. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, the, I, I, yeah, I've brought forward the next project, which I didn't expect, and which is a huge um, positive thing to come out of this. Mm. Um, and, and at the start of this, I I didn't think I was going to. I thought I was just going to let my business almost go back a year. Mm. Uh, um because i had a lovely year set out and i was so excited and when when apart from obviously feeling fortunate that we had a home and, and jobs um and worried about the rest of the world i was quite um i forgot what i was going to say sorry i'm going off on a tangent <laughs> no it's so it, yeah i know what you mean it's um it's none of us could have predicted where we'd be right now and how that might have affected well all kinds of things and so it's really interesting now, have you got a favorite technique i mean obviously the this the scandinavian that particular way of i'm still not going to say it but that particular way of doing it is but is there is there something that you it, that you really a particular method that just is your favorite well, Krupprad is definitely the favourite. It's just oh. like, it's just going home. It's just so, I shouldn't belittle it, but it feels so effortless to me. Mm. I just, I, it's like handwriting. I just know what to do. 
Yeah. And so that's definitely, but I also love block weave. If I want to get the job done and, you know, produce a really good quality rug, there's this technique. Um, and that's more, that's a more popular rug weaving technique because you get the most gorgeous selvages. That's the edges. Yeah. Um, and it's reversible. So that's really satisfying. And I have, I have done art panels on a fine scale with this technique as well. So this is, this is, that's sort of feeding into the new thing that's coming. Okay. Okay. Like that. that sounds great. But yeah, if you, if you think, you know, rug weaving, block weaves are definitely more satisfying. It's, it's quicker as well. Still not quick, but it's quicker. <laughs> right. Um, I just meant to say, if anybody's got any questions, please feel free. Um, you can type the question at the side in the chat, uh, at the chat box there, and I'll keep an eye on it. Um, or, or if you would like to ask a question yourself live, do um, just say, I'd like to ask a question and, and you can unmute your microphone and, and um, take part because it would be lovely to uh, hear anything that you've got to say and uh, participate in this. So feel free to join in, that would be lovely. Um, so, so influences wise, I mean, you mentioned about how Annie Albers has certainly recently uh, been able to bring, to, with that big exhibition, a, a mainstream um, content in a way. But have, are there any other things, I mean, the, in, the Indian and, and the colours and the influence, but is, is there anything else that you find does influence you or where do you find your influences? Yeah, so that, the graffiti, I mean, I can literally walk past the graffiti for three or four months and then one day I'll suddenly realise it's come into the weaving without, it kind of, that happens subconsciously. Um, uh, good to Stoltz, I'd say her weaving more than Annie Albers has inspired me. Mm -hmm. um, and then lots of, lots of um, artists who get name checked particularly with weavers, Rothko really lends himself to, you know, those gorgeous blocks of colour lends himself to weaving. And the Bridget, oh, Bridget Riley. So I, I've always loved Bridget Riley. Um, and I managed to go in at the end of January, I think, to the, to the exhibition in the Haywood. Did you go there? Did you see? No, it? I didn't. No. Oh, oh my God. And I was, again, anything like that when I'm, I feel like it's a, a massive escape from my busy normal life didn't talk too much about it but I was two hours just to stand in front of these oh the god the way those colors jumped out of the paintings um and I, I, was, I, I was thinking about this earlier because I, I didn't know if it might pop up in the chat but I was just so happy and just every, the way the paintings were moving and that's coming into my art panels a bit as well oh that's interesting but there's as weavers, you, you've got that attention to detail, you've got that BDI to just, you, you, see, you see so many, well, you'll see a mistake straight away. It's so obvious, you get so used to it. And I stood admiring these paintings in this happy place. And I noticed that oh, there's one where someone's dropped a paintbrush on it when they're making it. So <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And it's so minute. And I don't, and the guy who was stood next to me when I spotted it, he's like, how did you see that? And I was like, oh, that's... It's your eye that you've got. But it was so reassuring just to see this, um, you know. Well, it's so it. human, isn't it? There it is. It was, and it, it was lovely. And yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm always saying this to my students, uh, which is that, um, you know, polymaths and people who are just interested in everything, that that's what makes successful creatives isn't it that you just absorb and, and it can come from so many different places and you just you just need to look and it and it and you find yeah. so many things I will yeah my, my studio I'm not in somebody's just asked to think yes, about, about your loom yeah and I'm not at, I'm in my kitchen at the moment in my in my temporary home studio so I haven't got the loom but um there's some pictures on my Instagram and on my website at Angie Parker Textiles but um, but the yarns, the materials themselves, especially when I'm working on a fine scale, because when I I used to work in the West End in London, I'm heartbroken for what's going on in the industry at the moment. Um, I love theatre. Um, so I, I used to go to Handweaver Studio. Um, any of the textile enthusiasts may know of that. I, when it was out in Walthamstow, 
I used to go out on the underground and I'd have samples on my lap on the underground and you know stitching the ends um, and I could just I joked about my 70 quid a time habit in Hanwee the studio <laughs> <laughs> it was there, yeah, sorry, shouldn't be nifty. But and I I was led by colour. I'd I'd just buy the colours. I didn't care what the what yarn it was. I was not interested in any of the details. And this is where I'm not a typical weaver, Kate, that we were talking about the other day. Because i weavers I know, oh my god, their notebooks are stunning. They are things of beauty and they know exactly everything. I just make it and then I try and work out a few years later what the hell I did. What's going on? But um, yeah, so so in Hanwick, so I just I've still got some of them. They're a little bit old and tired now, but and most of them have been used up. But yeah, just built this collection of yarn. So I could literally go to my, you know, go to my box and just pick out the colours that were working that day. And it depended on the weather, and it depended on you know whatever thing which colours looked right that day, and mm -hmm. was led by that. So yeah, it's the materials as well. Yeah. Well, actually, someone's asked, do you use vegetable dyes or how does that work materials wise? How do you source your yarns? I'll, I used to dye and I used to use direct dyes. Um, there's a lot of fabulous weavers I know who are doing some amazing natural dyeing. So I'm leaving that to them. I've got enough to do. Um, but my, my signature that yellow which I because I had it dyed and had it woven to a certain specification I thought I can name it so this color which I'm about to show you now this is called Sellafield yellow oh wow <laughs> that's fabulous you like the name yes <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> in the dark. so I have this I have this dyed at a mill in Yorkshire where I, I source a lot of my yarn from and my lovely friend up there he rang three times and he's like, do you really want that colour? <laughs> like, Why do you want that colour? It's horrible. And I'm like, I love that colour. So uh, sorry for the Yorkshire accent there. I'm not very good at accents. But yes, so I've got, um, I'm, I'm running a bit low. I don't know whether to do it again. But so quite, yeah, that, so you source it that way. Uh, Nash is asking, I wondered what's the, uh, what the top lessons you've learned from making craft into a business. So you mentioned that biz the business side of things is really part of your passion as well. But how... Um, have you got sort of a top, how did a top tip? Oh, that, you see now that it just, you've got to just know your own situation. That's totally hard to answer. You know, you, whether you're supported, you know, my husband paid the mortgage when I started the business. So I didn't have that stress, but as my business has grown up, obviously taken on more. So just know where you're at. But I think the most important thing would be to get your little, I'm going to use a, and one of those on trend words get your tribe around you get get other people around you because you can as a, as a business of one person you cannot do it on your own so i'm really lucky i've got the scene textile collective penny's there gives them the wave again penny um and we can all just just dump um another one was set up um at the hot house i built a really lovely little safety bed of, of other makers there you meet people at fairs. I mean, a lot of them just happen organically. But uh, Patricia van den Acker from the Design Trust, who I'm a huge fan of her, and she knows it. Um, she basically uh, talked me into setting up an accountability group in Bristol. And I was like, oh, I'll do it. But you can't man make, you can't manufacture a support group. It has to just happen, but I'll try it, I'll try it. And she bloody knows her stuff after two years now of meeting once a month and we're all the local you get that trust and we've got a whatsapp group and no matter what it is whether it's a question about packaging or a question about motivation you know anything we've got we can just fire it out so yeah lots and lots of things to are very important but i think having people around you yeah, and actually I'd add my two pennies worth there about social media. Um, I'm, I'm a big Instagram user and, um, and I do, for Sarah, I do when she does her days about um, selling, prepare to sell days, um, I, I do the social media bit. And um, if you can bear to really go for it on Instagram, um, that is, is, it can be a really great community. And I think, you know, as the digital, that digital platform as we're learning here now and with what Sarah's doing, with the festival, I think is um, a space that can work for people. So yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, 
Desiree is asking, how often do you exhibit in exhibitions? Um, and that it was great to see your work in the uh, RWA Open in Bristol last year. So oh, do, you get to exhibit, do you get to exhibit a lot? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, it's just a case of organising when. Yeah, it's... What else have I done? Um, I did um, a show at Ruthin with lots of other rug weavers last year called Under Your Feet. That was um, particularly good. So you've got to, a lot of the opportunities you can make yourself and then some of them you're obviously just going to be seen in the right place at the right time and get selected. Um, but yeah, the fine art ones, they're my little treat for me in a way. Mm. They're not necessarily, I do sell the art panels, but they're not anything I could ever bank on in terms of business. They're, they're just Yeah, it's a slightly... So I'm very careful yeah. not to overinvest in that because with my time, it's just there's only so many hours in the day. But yeah. Yes, well, exactly, especially with family. Um, uh, Dan is asking, uh, did you use a linen warp for your block weave rug and what weft yarns did you use? I did, Sam. Yes, so you were a rug weaver. Um, but yes, I've got a really nice linen, uh, which I import from Belgium. Yes, and I, you need that non-stretch in the warp. And the weft is Axminster rug wool predominantly, but typically if I found the right colour and it's not Axminster, then there will be some other rug wool. So suppliers, uh, suppliers is, um, you know, you're building up good relationships with suppliers like that. So that, that's the whole other unseen part of this kind of thing, isn't it? Yeah. And luckily I am pretty well stocked. Um, I did, I did stock up just uh, by a bit of good luck. Um, before lockdown um, there's no sure <laughs> anyway, Jodie if Jodie's managed to still be here um, yeah there's no so I, could, I was doing some I'm doing some remote teaching as well and a student said can you send me some purple yarns the other day and I I said oh I haven't, I haven't got much purple and I went into the studio and it's like oh my god I've really got to rein it in so <laughs> But there's, I mean, in fact, anyone, that's, if we've got a few other people starting talking about business, this is, this is also my new best friend. I've instigated this, um, it's called Profit First. Am I allowed to advertise? By Mike, Mike McCallowitz, I think. But he's, he, it's just about being frugal in the early days and not, you know, mm -hmm. much as we love buying yarn, it's like, buy what you need, don't go mad. Yeah, rein that habit in. <laughs> Um, Heidi's saying, if you were going to collaborate on a piece of work, who would it be with and why? Oh, my goodness me. Oh, that's a, oh no, I, I should have an answer on the spot for that, shouldn't I? Well, I've, I have done some really nice collaborations. I collaborated with a furniture maker, John, Jonathan Rose. Um, oh, my goodness me. No, I'm, I can't. Can I come back to that? Yeah, no, you can. You, and, but that's nice, isn't it? So it's not just, you know, when you're... That's the great thing about something like textiles is that you can then collaborate with something like a furniture maker or with, you know, it has, it's got that flexibility. I mean, literally flexibility, but um, in, in different ways. Yeah. I'm just going to, I'll just pick. I know you're mulling that now. Well, no, I'm just going to pick someone who's incredibly, incredibly famous. <laughs> I'm trying to think of who the famous, most famous person in the world is. <laughs> give it some thought I'll come back to you uh, Becky's asking she says I spin my own yarns and I'm drawn to try and weaving where to start what type of loom is a good starter that's a good question fantastic well you can start with a simple frame loom you could start this afternoon just take a, the glass and a picture out of the frame and, and wrap some warp round to that and just weave in and out and that's um you know some nice basic tapestry but um as you advance, you can a rigid heddle loom, lovely way to start. Backstrap weaving looms, they're very, um, you could, very cost effective and you'll become part of the loom for that. It's where you just raise and lower the heddle and you can attach yourself to, you do that outside and tie yourself to a tree. And then um, as you advance um, and, uh, and want to get beyond, beyond a rigid heddle loom, you'd be looking at looms with different shafts and I actually stock um, Louette, a four shaft Louette loom on my website and I'm not kidding you it's the most cute thing in the world because the table looms the smallest size you can work from on a loom like that they're, they're quite heavy and the castle sticks up and they're a pain to move around the house and not that I've done that lots but um, the Louette one the castle the, the bit 
that sticks up in the middle, you can fold it down. Um, so it's lightweight, it comes with a bag. So, so work your way up. But yeah, start off with frame weaving. And then as you advance, rigid head was the next natural step. And then the four shaft loom. Nice. Um, well, I think that's, we, we're coming out of time. In fact, we've slightly run over, but that's absolutely brilliant. Um, so sure. so I just want to say thank you so much, Angie, for that. It's so great to be able to have a proper detailed chat with you. Because although I have spoken to you over the last couple of weeks, it hasn't, you know, this is, this is much... Um, much longer to be able to have a proper chat so thank you to everybody that joined us it was lovely to have you here and um thank you for giving us so much brilliant detail about what you do oh and i'm just looking at the comments now and thank you oh. i'm really chuffed that it isn't just me and you kate and no no no, no. <laughs> are just enjoying and I uh, you know remember this will be I think Sarah mentioned at the beginning that this will be uh, this is recording and so it will it will turn up as a film on the YouTube channel in the next I think by the middle of next week uh, so if there's any bits that you missed or anything that you want to go back and and kind of take in again you'll be able to do that and then loads of stuff obviously we did the show and tell together so there's there's that um, on the website as well but but go and have a browse at your everything that you do on your website it's all there oh it's lovely thank you kate really nice chatting thank you well have a good day everybody and thanks for joining us <laughs>